My name is Katie Edge, and I'm privileged to be here today to participate in the Tennessee Bar Foundation's Legal History Project. We're here today, July 19, 1999, in the office of Miller, Martin, and Tribune in Nashville, Tennessee, with Charles Clay Tribune, Jr., the senior most member of our law firm. We honor him in the Tribune conference room with his portrait behind me. Mr. Tribune was born in Nashville on August 10, 1910, to Charles Clay and Julia Malone Tribune, both of whom are native Nashvilleans. Mr. Tribune, thank you very much for joining me here today for this conversation. Mr. Tribune, thank you for joining us here today. I'd like to start this conversation with you um, with a little bit of background information about your family. Uh, we've already said that your uh, parents are native Nashvilleans, as are you. Um, tell us about your grandparents and, and your family. Well, my great-grandfather was the first person in the family named Charles Clay Tribune. He was born in Kentucky and came to Nashville as a teenager to join uh, Andrew Jackson's forces. They were fighting the Spanish and Indian wars in Florida. And then he settled in Nashville and became a mayor of Nashville in 1840 and 41. Uh, he, he was named, he got the, got the name, his mother was Jane Clay, who was a cousin of Henry Clay in, of Kentucky. <clears throat> and he was active in political circles. And he had several children, one of whom was my grandfather, George Tribune. George was with the Western Union Telegraph Company but he resigned and, joined the con and enlisted in the Confederate Army where he fought for a year. Uh, at that time, he was, the need for communication was so great that, that they turned him loose to be, to be back in the telegraph system. And after the war was over, uh, he uh, became the superintendent of Western Union for the whole South and uh, was for a while a director of the Western Union Telegraph Company. He had four children, one of whom was my father, and uh, my father's parents both died while he was during his 12th year. He was 12 years old. and. Uh, he made a, he had a fine record. He was the only member of the family who took a complete education. Uh, and he went to Vanderbilt where he uh, uh, was uh, an honor student and played baseball and tennis and was editor in chief of the annual. <clears throat> He entered the law school where he won the Founders Medal for Scholarship, which is being number one in the class, and became one of the strong lawyers of the South. Uh, and I could talk a long time about his career, but, but he, he, he was recognized as, uh, he, he was the finest, he was the best lawyer that I ever knew and the finest man that I ever knew. And, it was it was just uh, a feeling that I've had all along that he knows what I what I'm doing and uh, approves or disapproves of it. My mother's father, incidentally, was Thomas H. Malone, who had been to the University of Virginia. He came from Athens, Alabama, uh, and he was employed by the Methodist Church in 1872 to incorporate the Central University of the Methodist Episcopal Church South, which is a nice 
long name and a degree from that university would have been very impressive. But uh, the next year, after Bishop McTeer's wife had persuaded uh, Commodore Vanderbilt's wife to persuade the Commodore to give a million dollars to this new university, why Mr. Malone had the name changed to the Vanderbilt University. And then he was requested to set up the law school, which he did using practicing lawyers in Nashville for the faculty. And the uh, classes were held in the Vanderbilt Building, which is located where the uh, Nations Bank Building is now. And the classes were held in the afternoons. Uh, my father and mother uh, built a house on a farm which Mr. Malone owned, which adjoined the Bell Mead property. It was a hundred acres out there, and it went back from where St. George's Church is out to the, out to the Bell Mead plantation and back towards Linwood Boulevard. <clears throat> And, and as I say, I could talk a long time about my father's career. He was a fine man and a fine lawyer. Do you have uh, brothers and sisters? I had one brother, uh, and uh, Tom died in about 1983. What did he do for a living? He, he was in the, in the insurance business. He sold, represented John Hancock and was a very successful uh, insurance agent. Tell us about your wife and your family. Well, uh, in nineteen in the in the nineteen thirties, I'll start this way. I, I, my father was employed by the uh, power companies to uh, represent them in litigation with the. Tennessee Valley Authority, and I went with him to New York. My job at that, on that trip was carrying his briefcase, <clears throat> but we met Wendell Wilkie, who was chairman of Commonwealth and Southern, which owned the Tennessee Electric Power Company, and who later ran for president against Roosevelt, I think, the, his second time, and was it was a pretty close race. At any rate, when I got back from, uh, we, we went on the train, and when we got back from Nashville, uh, one of my friends said, uh, they called me judge then, although I never have, have been a judge, but, but, but lawyers sometimes get called judge, even when they're very young. Uh, says, I've got a date for you to go to the Nashville Vols tonight. And uh, I said, who is it? He said, Mary Hamilton. And I said, okay. So I took Mary to the game. <clears throat> and from that time on, I had tunnel vision as far as girls were concerned. And uh, Mary and I were married. That was 1935. We were married in July 1936. And celebrated our 63rd wedding anniversary just a, f a few days ago last week. That's wonderful. Uh, how old were you when you uh, met your wife? I was 26 years old I, when I met, well I had, I had met Mary but I hadn't paid much attention to her up, up until I started Suddenly, my eyes were opened, and I saw what she. <laughs> Did that make you a baseball fan forever and always? After that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, my, my, Mary's father, incidentally, was uh, went to Vanderbilt, and supposedly is the only person in the history of Vanderbilt to earn sixteen varsity letters. He had four letters in football, basketball, baseball, and track set some track records, was captain of the baseball team, and was all-conference in football. 
So I've, I've been interested in athletics. My father, incidentally, represented Vanderbilt University uh, in the uh, uh, litigation with the Methodist Church, which established the right of the Board of Trust to elect its own members, which divorced it from the, from the church. That was in 1914, before I, when I was four years old, so I didn't know a lot about that trial until later. <laughs> Probably wasn't very much later, though, that, that you uh, learned all about the law. Tell us about your children. Well, I have four children. Julia, who, all, all four of them are Vanderbilt graduates, and three of them have graduate degrees. Uh, Julia uh, went to New York and became an actuary with the book advertising, uh, Buck, Buck Actuarial Company, which is, was an international outfit. And she is now retired and living in Nashville at, at Lion's Head. She married a Spaniard whom she met. Judy went to, went to New York as a UN guide and uh, met this boy from Spain and they were married and they are still married. Then. My daughter, Ju my daughter Mary, uh, is a librarian and is at the Green Hills branch. She has two, two, two children, uh, a son who is a, an architect in New York and a daughter who is married to Bo Spencer, who is a clique. Uh, some of like this summer with, with this law firm. <clears throat> and then Charles, who uh, went to Vanderbilt, and uh, he, he played football at, 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 at Vanderbilt. He was a fine athlete and actually had, he was recruited by uh, Tennessee and uh, Georgia Tech and Alabama as well as Vanderbilt. And he came to Vanderbilt and uh, it was, uh, he didn't have very much fun uh, in, in athletics. He, he had more playing time than any other backfield man, but uh, it, it, he, he didn't like to lose. <laughs> then Tony, my younger son, uh, also went to Vanderbilt. He went to the Vanderbilt Medical School and is now an OBGYN doctor. He lives in Williamson County, but has his office in Nashville. And uh, Charles Tribute III is a lawyer with this firm as well, That's is right. that right? He, he, he has recently, he said, retired. <laughs> and, uh, so that, uh, as I explained to uh, somebody recently, he is the most hard-headed member of our family. <laughs> um, you grew up in Nashville. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the Nashville that you knew as a boy? Well, I, I lived in what is now Bell Mead. It was uh, out in, It was about five miles west of west of Nashville. Uh, Nashville was uh, a small town, I guess maybe 75,000 people in the, uh, in, maybe in the county, I'm not sure about that, but it was, it was sparsely populated. But there was, <clears throat> it, it was a, a it, 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 it was a fine city and was, called, was known as the Athens of the South was because of Vanderbilt University and Fisk and Meharry and uh, Peabody, uh, the George Peabody College for Teachers, which is now part of Vanderbilt. And uh, there were other higher educational places in, 
around here. Uh, there was a streetcar that, that uh, came as far as Wilson Avenue on, when, when I was a little boy, where the Westminster Presbyterian Church is, where Wilson Avenue intersects with the West End out with, with Harding Road. Later that line was brought on out to the Percy Warner Park, and that was when Bell Mead was developed. And I remember seeing the Bell Mead Boulevard being built by penitentiary labor, with people with uh, striped suits with their leg chains on and a, and a guard with a double barrel shotgun watching them. And I would sit in the, what is now, where Bill Earthman's house is, in the field and, 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 and watch them work. Where did you go to school, Mr. Trujillo? I started at the Peabody Demonstration School where I, I had went to grammar school. Uh, I went there through the seventh grade, and then I transferred to the Wallace University School, which was a very fine uh, preparatory school for boys. It was a, uh, and it enjoyed a, as one, the, the reputation as being the best when I was there. My father had gone to Montgomery Bell Academy where he had uh, uh, graduated in 1887. And I have two grandsons who graduated from Montgomery Bell in 1987. Oh, wow. but, but Wallace was, was the school where I went. Now, is Wallace School, was it in Nashville or was it? Was, it was a, in a, a red brick building, formerly a residence, on the north side of West End Avenue, directly across the street from the Cathedral of the Incarnation. I see. Oh. And that was, the, that was the, the, we didn't have any campus. We didn't have a gymnasium. We had maybe 150 boys in all at, at the largest uh, number. And uh, Mr. Wallace, I think his, ambition was to create, was to, was to turn out honorable gentlemen first and scholars next. And the leaders of Nashville were surprisingly, uh, I think, outnumbered the graduates of, of, of any other preparatory school or high school in this neighborhood. Can you and, remember some of your classmates who have been prominent in Nashville? I can't, I couldn't tell you right now, well, Mr. Charles Nelson, who was president of the Nashville Trust Company, was a Wallace graduate, and all of his boys went there. Uh, Mr., uh, well, I, 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 I would have to refer to it. I, I, I've, I've known them in the past, but I can't remember them. That's all right. Uh, uh, obviously, you went to uh, uh, Vanderbilt University. Did you ever consider going anyplace else? No, I just assumed that I would go to Vanderbilt. It, it never occurred to me that I, would go, that I would go anywhere else. I did spend one year at the University of North Carolina, but that was... Uh, Just a, a sort of a deviation. It was it was a good year for me to do that. That was my second year of law. I, I split my law law edu legal education. Can you tell us why you did that? Was there any particular reason? Well, I had uh, my father, as I explained earlier, had been first in his class. Always, he was valedictorian at Montgomery Bell at the age of 15, uh, and the first in his law class. And uh, my record at Vanderbilt was, was not very good, 
and uh, they thought it would be a good idea if, if I got out of town. I was, uh, I had thought that I had discovered that uh, uh, outside interests were a lot more interesting than what I learned in, 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 in the lecture halls. And when I came back to Vanderbilt, I, uh, I, I, I did have a, a, a real good record my senior year, but, but that's, that, 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 that was my best year in school. Is there any particular remembrance of your college days and before you went to law school that you'd like to share with us? Any professors that you remember or any recollections? Well, I can tell you some stories about uh, uh, Vanderbilt was a was a small Southern liberal arts college with an outstanding faculty. Uh, we had uh, winning athletic programs. Uh, there was one, I'll, I'll tell you one story about it. It was a, one of my best friends was a lawyer named Shelby Coffey, who came from Columbia, Tennessee, and was, uh, he was a, a basketball captain, but, but he also had A's in his schoolwork. <clears throat> and he was a friend of a, of a boy named Marion Sadler great big guy from Clarksville, I think. <clears throat> and one Sunday morning, uh, the brothers at the SAE fraternity house sent Shelby Coffee down to the jail to get Brother Sadler, who had spent the night down there. And when he, when he got there, he, he told the desk sergeant he had come from Marion Sadler. And the sergeant says, got nobody named Sadler. And Coffee says, well, let me go back in and look for him. So he went back in, and there was Sadler, and he brought him out. He says, here he is. And the sergeant says, that ain't Marion Sadler. That's James H. Kirkland. That was the name of the chancellor, incidentally. <laughs> there were those sort of things that happened. I can't, I can't. Uh, recall a particular instance. I, I, did you live on campus or did you live at home? No, I, I, I lived at home. Okay. Um, you obviously went to uh, Vanderbilt to law school. Uh, when did you start to law school? What year was that? I entered Vanderbilt Law School in 1930 and took my senior year in absentia so that I could graduate with my class. But uh, I got my law degree then in 1933. Mm. Who were some of your classmates? In law school, I was, uh, well, there was Carl Carney, who won the Founders Medal in my class. Uh, came from Ripley, Tennessee, uh, and later was the chief judge, I think, of the Court of Appeals for the Western Division. Uh, there was Roy Kennedy, who uh, was in the real estate business. Very few of them practiced law. You see, 1933 was the bottom of the Depression. And I, I, I practiced law because my father had a law firm and I was, off, I was given a job. Actually, he had fogged this firm for my benefit because his clients were, had important things to do 
and he wanted me to do some blocking and tackling in the trial court. Uh, and uh, so he formed a, few, uh, a firm with, with William Hume and George Armstead called Tribune Hume and Armstead. And after several months, uh, I began receiving a salary of $50 a month, which was uh, which living at home, and I didn't have an automobile, and the, the, the car fare I think was seven cents to, to ride in town on the streetcar. So you were rich in those days. I was I was <laughs> able to be an eligible young bachelor. But not for long, apparently. Once you met Mary. Right. <laughs> um, what do you remember? about law school that um, from your professors or particular courses that you took that you think is interesting or the most significant that you could share with us? I uh, had constitutional law under Dean Arnold. Now, let me say this about the law school. His predecessor was uh, Mr. Keeble, who was a practicing lawyer. And during almost all of its existence, up, to, up until 1930, 30, uh, the dean of the law school was a Nashville lawyer who, had a, who was engaged in, 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 in practicing law. And uh, Dean Arnold was, I thought, the first, and Bill Waller once told me there had been one predecessor back in the teens who was a full-time professor. But, uh, but Dean Arnold was a, was, was a full-time professor. He taught constitutional law and, and was a good teacher. I think the best teacher maybe that I ever had in law school was Mr. Ed C, spelled S-E-A-Y, <clears throat> uh, and uh, Mr. C taught real property to the freshmen, uh, and he would pick out some student in the class and say, Ms. Jones, who's a poor widow woman, has got all she's got in this world is one piece of real estate. And she comes to you and asks you this question, what do you tell her? And you t tell you what you would tell her. And then he would say, then she comes to you and asks you another question. And then the first thing you knew, you had lost that property for her. <clears throat> and then there was no air conditioning. The windows were up. We were over the top floor of Kirkland Hall. He would shout. You could hear him down on. 21st Avenue, what did you tell her wrong for a tribute? And I said, don't know, sir. No, no, because you didn't study the law. And that, but, that, but that is the kind of thing. And, and it, but it kept everybody on their toes all the time because something like that would, would, would happen. Uh, Verrill, my senior year, was a fine teacher. He taught trial practice uh, moot, moot court. Uh, Mr. Hendrick taught criminal law and I, I can't remember the, 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 the fact of that. Well, there was Dr. Dr. Skirmerhorn uh, was a was a fine teacher, and he always dressed with uh, uh, black coat and striped trousers, and uh, he was a natural born actor, but he knew his subjects very well. And the, the class ahead of me had a bunch of rapscallions in it, and uh, uh, they would. Every now and then, when he would be writing something on the board, one of them would get up and slip out the door when his back was turned. <clears throat> and then, 
pretty soon the second one would 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 come out to, to do that and the first one would come out would wait until the door was opened a little bit and then he would grab it and slam it and there this guy would be left standing there by the door with the door slammed and he had to go back and take his seat. <laughs> One of the things that you talked about a little earlier was that in your particular law school class uh, many of, of the graduates of the law school didn't actually practice law because of the depression and the, the times. Um, do you recall what they did with their law degrees? I mean, what kind of businesses they went into, and whether or not that law degree still was valuable to them? Well, there was Tom Weaver, who was uh, not a law student. He was a doctor. He and I were in the same class. Uh, golly, uh, lots of them went to work for the General Shoe Corporation, which became Genesco. Uh, Olin West did that. Tom Fuqua did that. John E. Zell did. I'm trying to think of my contemporary. How How Dobson never went to college at all, but but he went joined the Dobson Hicks. Feed and Grain Company down on Second Avenue, uh, which his father had started, and his brothers were were running. Uh, incidentally, uh, this uh, Sadler, whom I mentioned earlier, the first job that he had when he got out of undergraduate school was loading baggage on DC-3 airplanes for American Airlines at the original uh, Sky Harbor out here between around uh, uh, b between here and Murfreesboro which was Nashville's original airport and Sadler kept on, finally became chairman of American Airlines. And his nickname was Dog. And one time when he was chairman of American Airlines, Shelby Coffee called him up and, and said, Dog, this is Shelby. He said, my daughter wants to be a stewardess. Sadler says, send her to me. And she luckily got the job. So that night that uh, Mr. Coffey got him out of jail paid off in, in the That's end. Right. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I think our, our viewers would be interested in is your, um, your notion of how law school curricula has changed over the years from your days at Vanderbilt to uh, law schools now. And one of the things that particularly interests me is uh, your recollection that uh, many of the law school professors were practicing lawyers in Nashville when they were teaching at Vanderbilt. And of course, the, at the Nashville School of Law, that is how that works now for that school. Did you think at the time that you were getting uh, a, a practical uh, education from those practicing lawyers? Well, the law was not specialized in those days as it is now. Uh, I guess the lawyers would be divided into two categories, the, the, the civil lawyers and the criminal lawyers. Uh, I, I had a course in taxation at Vanderbilt, but I don't remember much about it. Uh, I had a class in torts, but I later got uh, the history of the lawsuit and, and, and Carruthers, and, and, and I, I learned more from it than I did in, in my class. Uh, to, well, to, to illustrate, uh, 
the tax laws were so much simpler in those days. There was an exemption um, uh, of forty thousand dollars, I think, from taxation, plus another forty thousand dollars, which would be payable to the surviving spouse. Now that would, that was all there was. Uh, you you couldn't. Uh, all of these things now the uh, charitable remainder trusts and the charitable lead trusts and the qualified personal residence trust and things like that uh, hadn't been dreamed up. The, in fact, there was no marital deduction in the first. The first one was uh, you could give one half of your estate to, you, to, to the surviving spouse, uh, tax-free, but the, but the balance of it would be subject to taxation. It, but that's the, uh, now, in, in 1943, I was by myself, and I bought from Conway's Clearing House a federal tax guide, which was a one-volume loose-leaf book that new pages would come every month, uh, maybe more frequently. And with that book, I could either find the answer or find where to find the answer to any federal tax question that I was asked. Uh, now we have tax library, which is maybe as big as this room, with books up to the ceiling. And any lawyer who practices tax law hasn't got time to learn anything else. You, you, the, the, the specialization is, uh, has, has become sort of like the doctors. And it used to be that the family doctor treated you for everything except it maybe surgery. Now they send you to all these different tests. When you graduated from Vanderbilt, you went into your father's law firm, is that right? That's right. Um, tell us something about that firm, the kind of work that you did and how long you were with that firm. All right. Uh, Hume and Armstead had a very large insurance practice. They defended many uh, damage cases all over Middle Tennessee. <clears throat> and I spent uh, a lot of time First, sitting at the council table with uh, one of the older members of the firm, that was uh, Mr. Hume and Armstead, and a lawyer named Lindsey Davis, who was one of the finest trial lawyers that I've known, who never went in the library. He says, if it's right, there's bound to be some laws for it. But uh, I would write briefs and argue cases in the Court of Appeals. But that's ahead of the story. Uh, one of the things that we did, which the young associates no longer can do, uh, Mr. Hume would say to me, Charlie, George Armstead is going to try a case with Seth Walker this morning over in the courthouse. Go over there and watch it. You'll learn a lot about trying cases by watching lawyers work. <clears throat> and I would go over there and I would find Jimmy Bass, who is the, my age and my relative. Uh, and he and I would sit and watch Mr. Armstead and Mr. Walker try a damage suit. 
and see how they handle their witnesses and how they develop their theories of the case. Listen to them argue the cases. Uh, now, uh, my associates have got to pay their way, have got to log time. And, and, and the idea of just going over and, and listening to somebody try a lawsuit, I, I, I don't guess would be uh, a good idea. But <clears throat> let me say this also <clears throat> about, the, about, about the practice of law in 1933 and on up until the middle 1930s. Uh, small cases could be tried before a justice of the peace. And members of the county court were authorized to, to try cases. They didn't have to know any law. They weren't, they, they, very few of them had any legal background. Uh, and they were not paid a salary by the state or county or city. They got their uh, earnings out of the court costs. And so uh, they would be inclined to favor the lawyer who filed his case in, b b before that particular magistrate. Uh, and this I understood was case law, and I don't, never have seen it. But I understood that, that the Supreme Court had said that a defendant has a reasonable time to get to court before a justice of the peace, and that a reasonable time would be an hour. And so cases were set for trial, and this is the, the way they were set. At nine meaning ten, or at ten meaning eleven, and if if if, if the warrant said ten o'clock, you didn't go to the go to the courthouse, didn't didn't go to the squire's office until eleven when the case would be called and tried. Now that would result in in this sort of a situation. Lots of uneducated people who had been sued before, uh, to come before Justice of the Peace <clears throat> uh, would go at 9 o'clock when the warrant said and sit around and wait for half an hour and finally give up and go home and then his case would, would be called at 10 o'clock and a default judgment would go down against him. It, it, was a, it was a very bad, very bad situation. How long did that kind of practice go on in, in the courts in Nashville? Well, it, went, it was all over Tennessee. Uh, the, the General Sessions courts came in, as I remember it, about 1937, along in there, and but the jurisdiction was $500. I could tell you a story about a trial well, there were two, two things, one involving a justice of the peace. <clears throat> Back in, when I was by myself, every week I went by every bank and made, just told some stories and shook hands with my friends there, hoping that they would send me a $15 collection case or something like that. Well, uh, I got to be good friends with Mr. Paul Davis, who was at that time president of the American National Bank. He was Mac Davis' his uncle. And Mac uh, Davis is, practices law here in Nashville Yeah, he today. practices right. law here in Nashville. He was a member of the Waller Law Firm now. Uh, and uh, Mr. Davis told me that his wife's chauffeur had been arrested for 
speeding or some traffic violation and had a, 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 been cited to appear before J.R. Allen, a justice of the peace who had an office on uh, Dedrick Street upstairs. <clears throat> well, uh, the, uh, he, Mr. Davis told me he had called the squire's office and said, how much is the fine? And I'll send it around. And the, uh, they said $10. So Mr. Davis wrote out a check, $10, J.R.L. J.P. And sent a bank messenger to carry it to Squire Allen's office. Pretty soon the messenger came back and gave Mr. Davis the check and said, Squire Allen say he don't take checks and he don't give receipts. So Mr. Davis gave the messenger a $10 bill and took it over there and the case got dis dismissed. <coughs> that was the way, that, 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 that was that, that story. <laughs> now, uh, one, one thing about, about the, the uh, uh, the, the General Sessions Court. Uh, there was one judge uh, who was a very, very, very colorful guy. I remember his name in a minute. Uh, and uh, Ben West, who was later mayor of Nashville, was prosecuting in the uh, the uh, misdemeanor cases before the uh, general in, in, the, in the general sessions court, and one time he had a, a defendant, a man who had been arrested for beating up his wife. She had had him arrested, sworn out the warrant, and uh, now the the general sessions court had no jurisdiction, of course, over divorce cases or or anything over five hundred dollars. But uh, uh, she remarked that she hadn't really been married uh, to this man, that she, she was his common-law wife. Well, Tennessee didn't recognize a common-law wife in those days. And so after a while she said she didn't really hate this guy. What she really wanted was a divorce. And Ben looked up at the judge and says, you heard a judge. And he picked up his gavel and said, divorce granted. And everybody went out of the courtroom happy. <laughs> when um, you uh, left your, your father's farm, tell us how, how that evolved and, and you going into practice by yourself. Uh, my father's business was uh, uh, he, he in, was was major major uh, things, and <clears throat> so at I, I I had actually argued a case in the United States Supreme Court uh, in about 1939, and. Uh, I, some of the younger members of the law firm had a falling out with my father, and the result was that he and I withdrew from that law firm in January 1942. Uh, I had persuaded my friend Overton Dickinson to join us, and we formed a firm of Tribune, Dickinson and Tribune, in January of 1942. Well, father died in September 1942. He had just completed his brief in a suit he had been employed by the state of Tennessee to recover property from Rogers Caldwell on the ground of a fraudulent conveyance. Uh, 
it is now the Eddington Center. And, and Father wrote that brief and filed it. And, and that, that was in July, and he died in September. And then in, in January, Dickinson uh, had married Kate Ohm King from Chattanooga, a daughter of Mr. Henry King. And he decided to go to Chattanooga and go in the grocery business with his father-in-law. And there I was. And I went up and talked to Judge Grafton Green, who was Chief Justice, and who was my friend, and been my father's friend. And I said, I guess I ought to try to get an association with another law firm. And he said, why don't you try practicing by yourself for a while? He said, your father did a mighty good job of it. And so I decided to do that, and I stayed in the offices in the National Trust Building where Overton and my father and I had been. And that, 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 that was the beginning of, of my my career, you might say. Let's go back. Um, tell me just a little bit about your the case in 1939 that you argued before the United States Supreme Court. What was that case about? That case... Was that the first one that you argued before the Supreme Court? Yes, the only case that I ever argued before the Supreme Court. I've, I've, I've had briefs things, but, but never, never argued another case. Uh, <clears throat> that case involved the taxation of a trust where, which became taxable upon the death of the, I guess, the settler of the trust. And there was the, the, the trustee was the National Trust Company and the set law was uh, li lived in Birmingham, a lady, and the question was whether it, it was taxable in Tennessee or Alabama. And the Supreme Court had said that the, transfer of property from the dead, dead to the living is a, is a single event which can only happen in one place. <clears throat> well, uh, the result was that the Supreme Court decided it was taxable in both places, so, so I didn't have a very auspicious uh, <laughs> entrance into the court. <clears throat> but I was very impressed by the court. Charles Evans Hughes was the Chief Justice, and I thought he looked like Zeus sitting up there in the middle of the court. Did the justices ask you questions during your argument? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm interested in how you prepared for that argument. Did you, did you practice? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got, you were a very young man when you did this. Well, I was a middle man, but I was, I was hoping it would be taxable in Alabama, which had a lower tax rate than Tennessee. Uh, we had tried it in, in the Tennessee courts, and they had said it was taxable in Tennessee and not Alabama. And so Alabama had appealed it. And, uh, I, well, I'll tell you this. I, when, when I got up at the outset, I was introduced by Edwin Hunt, who was an assistant Tennessee attorney general, attorney general, and a, a very, very brilliant lawyer. Uh, and he introduced me to the court, and then I made a motion to substitute uh, different people that we had a different 
uh, Commissioner of Finance and Taxation than when we filed the case. And the same thing in, in Alabama. And I was, I had trouble ma making the motion. I was sort of breathless in, in uh, doing that. But when, it, when I got ready to argue the case, I was completely relaxed and enjoyed it very much. Uh, and uh, they would ask questions, and, and you, uh, they were intelligent questions. I, uh, we're going to take a break here in just a minute. Uh, and when we come back, one of the things I'd like for you to, to talk about with us are some of the people that you have practiced with in, in uh, your law firm um, after you uh, left your father's firm and after you started your own. Um, let me ask you, though, before we uh, take a break, do you remember what your absolute first case was that you argued in a courtroom? Yeah. There was a, it, it was a trust case. Uh, a trust had been set up in Bedford County, Shelbyville, and uh, during the 1920s, various encroachments had been made on the corpus of the trust to buy automobiles for some of the beneficiaries. <clears throat> and uh, the result was that finally there was no trust left. And uh, Judge Sam Phelps, who was later a member of the Court of Appeals and also the Tennessee Supreme Court, uh, and was a very scholarly man, he and his partner, Reese Macy, from Columbia, filed a record for writ of error in the Court of Appeals without any transcript, just, just the, the, the record proper. And to surcharge the, the trustee for allowing these encroachments. Well, every encroachment had been approved by the Chancery Court up in Shelbyville. And uh, there had been a guardian ad litem appointed. And uh, I didn't see how I could lose that one. At any rate, Mr. Hume gave me that record and said, said Charlie, write the reply brief in this case. And so I wrote the brief. And when it got set for argument, which was, as I remember it, a day or two after I'd gotten my license, I'd received it and been sworn in. Uh, he said, Charlie, you wrote the brief, you go up and argue. And so I, I went up and, and argued it. And the Court of Appeals surcharged the trustees. So then I filed a petition for certiorari in the Tennessee Supreme Court, which was granted and I went up and argued that and won it. They reversed the Court of Appeals and dismissed the, the, the proceeding. And I can't remember any other time that the doggone Supreme Court ever granted a petition for certiorari when I had lost one. That's an auspicious beginning for a young lawyer to, to win a case in the Supreme Court, you know, just a short period of time after you uh, Got your law license. Who'd you say I've been? Uh, so you won the case in the Supreme yeah, I, Court. I, I, That's I, right. I, I, I won that case. Yes, sir. Uh, let's take a break now, and then we'll come back in a few minutes. All right. When we took our, our break a few minutes ago, you and I were talking about some of the differences in the practice of law from when you began it in the 30s to uh, today's practice. Can you tell our viewers more about that? 
Yes, the practice of law was not nearly as intense. Uh, it certainly was not as specialized. Uh, the senior members of the Nashville Bar, that is the, the leaders of the Nashville Bar, uh, were friends. And uh, if they needed to take a deposition, they would call up the other lawyer and say, I would like to take such and such a deposition. Uh, and how about such and such a date? And the other lawyer might say, that's my golf day, or so give, give some other reason. And then the, uh, you say, all right, we'll make it another day. How about, how about the, another date? And they would agree on it. Sometimes they would write a letter to confirm it, just say, we, we've agreed to take such a, such a deposition at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on July the 16th. <clears throat> uh, but uh, they, they would visit with each other. If, if, uh, now, in Tribute Human Armstead, had the seventh floor of the American Trust Building. The top floor of that building was the firm of Pitts, McConico, Hatcher, and Waller, which is now the Waller Law Firm. Uh, on the tenth floor was Bass, Berry, and Sims. On the third floor was Aust, McGugan and Evans. Uh, and I think Rutherford was on the second floor. Rutherford, fine. So that, that pretty well filled up that building with lawyers. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my father's closest friend probably, was Mr. K.T. McConico, and Mr. McConico, uh, time meant nothing to him. If, if father was a couple of hours late getting home for dinner in the, after, in the evening, uh, mother would know that he had gone by to see Mr. Mack and they had gotten into a conversation. They had opposite views, incidentally, of the, uh, of, 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 of the trial practice. Uh, Mr. Mack would write a 400-page brief, and the briefs in the Supreme Court, I think, were, were printed in those days, had to be printed. Uh, the, uh, my father would write a 50-page brief, and his emphasis was always on brevity, to, to make it short. He said, it's easier to read if you look at a page without any indentation for a paragraph. Uh, uh, it's discouraging to, to have to wade through that whole page. But <clears throat> there was a, 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 a very close friendship between the, the best lawyers in Nashville. And there was a trust. They had a, a, the, the oath didn't mean anything to them because they, they they told the truth, uh, and they, that, that word was as good as the bond. And they were all scholars, and that was a 
drugstore across the street from the National Trust building in the, in a, and in the basement of that drugstore was a place that got to, be, got to be known as the bullpen. And lawyers would go there at 9 o'clock to drink coffee and tell stories. And that would include uh, Bob Sturdivant and Holland Dodson, his brother-in-law. Uh, it would include Cecil Sims from Bass Bear and Sims. It, it included lawyers from all over town. There was, there was no, you, you d d didn't have to join it, just, just go down there and listen and, and, and listen to stories. Talk politics or law, swear at the judges. In that regard, I suspect things haven't changed a great deal. That maybe no, just I where imagine people it, meet. It, 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 it has, but <laughs> but the the the, the way of, of taking off for an hour in the morning, uh, almost every morning, uh, to 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 visit that way and 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 cement friendships that would last a lifetime uh, was was the kind of thing that I don't think uh, lawyers now. Indulge in. Of course, there are so many more lawyers now. Uh, golly, uh, I had a, a one-volume copy of the Martindale Hubble Legal Directory, which had for, for the year 1943, the first year that I was by myself, and it has all the lawyers in America. I believe in we it. have that. Behind it. you on the uh, credenza back there, yeah. that, that's every lawyer practicing in the United States, is that right? That's right. In every lawyer practicing in America. Yeah. yeah. And uh, now there's a whole shelf of, of, of lawyers. And specialization is, uh, has become as uh, prevalent in the law as it is in medicine. Talk to us a little bit, Mr. Tribu, about some of those special lawyers that you have practiced with um, over the years. You've, you've mentioned Mr. Hugh, Mr. Armstead, your father. But when you formed Tribu, Start of it and DeWitt, there was a very special group of men in that firm. In my firm? Yes, sir. Well, yeah. Uh, as I said, I think my father had probably the best practice in Nashville. Uh, and uh, when he died, he was 70 years old and died of, of heart trouble. And uh, it's a good number, uh, several of his class good many of his clients decided that since he had been such a good lawyer, they would give his son a chance. And so I got off to a, a, a sort of a running start. I had been practicing law for, for 10 years, for eight years by my, uh, with, with my father's law firm. But <clears throat> by 19, that was 1943. By 1946, I was having to turn down uh, uh, employment. I just wasn't able to a able to do it, and I was working till uh, nine o'clock at night uh, at home. But I couldn't stay awake after that. But I but I sometimes wake up and, 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 and can come to town at 4 o'clock. And I've seen the sun rise many times from my window in the National Trust Building. But I was, I, I was the, limit of, the, the, the limit of my abilities. And so I needed 
some help. And I had known Bob Sturdivant as a deputy clerking master. And I asked one or two of his friends, I said, would you rec recommend Bob? And they said, I would recommend him for anything. Well, I was, I, I caught him, he still had his Navy uniform on. And uh, he, he, he was, got his discharge from the Navy. And when I got him, Bob had the, had gotten the highest grade point average that had ever been made in a Vanderbilt Law School. I didn't realize that at the time, how, just how smart he was. But he had a, a wonderful sense of humor and an awful sound judgment in addition to his intellectual uh, qualities. So I got Bob, and he and I were together. We, and it, that was in 1946 that he joined me. In, in 1947, we formed a partnership of, of Tribune and Sturdivant. And then in 1950, uh, Bob was teaching a course in trial practice, I think, at the, at the Vanderbilt Law School. And he said, there's a boy out here, they say we've just got to get. And so we got Bill Harbison to join us. And Bill had beat Bob's academic record, which is very impressive. But Bob, you've got to also take into account that when Sturdivant was a, in law school, <clears throat> he was also running the switchboard at radio station WSM from 6 o'clock till midnight. Uh, and so uh, that, 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 that makes his that his uh, record even more impressive. So the three of us were together, and Bill was a fast learner, and he and I began trying cases together. Then, in, but trial work was taking up too much time, and uh, Ward DeWitt came over one day and said he had, he, he would like a job, and I said, how do you like trying cases? He says, I, I love it. Now, he might have, if I had said, how do you like having your teeth worked on, he might have said, I love it. Uh, but but, but, but he, 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 uh, that, that, that was on a Monday, and the following Monday, he was in our office. And... Uh, then Bob Taylor came along, and Fred Graham, and in 1947, I reckon, we moved into the Life and Casualty Tower building, which is across the street from this building. And we were the first tenants in there, and I had been doing a lot of work for the life, for life and casualty. I guess I, early in 1943, I wrote a letter of congratulations to Sidney Keeble Sr. on being elected general counsel of life and casualty. And pretty soon he asked me if I could help him out for half a day and so I began helping him out for a half a day. And I think I got paid $200 a month for that, uh, a, a, a sort of a retainer that kept on indefinitely for a long, long time. But, but, but we, we, we handled all of their outside legal work. So we, we were the first tenants in that building. Then Fred left and to, to write speeches for Estes Kefauver. And Fred kept us in hot water because he was a very liberal guy and uh, he wanted socialized medicine. 
one thing and another. We had lots of doctors who were clients of ours. And this is Fred, what's his last name again? Fred Graham. Fred Graham, okay. Yeah. He was later a reporter for the what, New York Times. Yes, and he reported the right. U.S. Supreme Court decision. I can't read it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I believe he was, he was with CBS, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and he, he, he left it to, to John as to keep on. And uh, Al Abbott came in and joined us. And Al, I think, is, has become and the, as fine a tax lawyer as he is in Tennessee. Mr. Abbey is still uh, practicing yes, with uh, Miller Martin and Tribune. That's right. Yeah. He stayed with us. Uh, we have I have had very good friends as 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 members of my law firm. I've, going back from to, to, to 1933 and going on, I've spent my life with my professional life with the very best lawyers in Tennessee. And, and it's been a very uplifting and rewarding and, and an enjoyable life. And I can't. I, 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 I can see that. One of uh, the lawyers that you mentioned uh, is someone that, that many of us uh, have a great deal of respect for, and that's Justice Bill Harbison. Can you tell us something about uh, Bill Harbison and his impact on the legal community here? Yeah. Bill as I said, was first in his class at Vanderbilt. <clears throat> but what he enjoyed more than anything else was trial work. When he died, I wrote the memorial resolution for the Supreme Court. And I said that I think that he liked the smell of a country courthouse on motion day. And uh, mingling with the with the with the lawyers, he was popular with everybody. He was a was a gentleman, but he was a a, a competitor. One time, he and I had a case we were trying, and I said, "Bill, why don't we stipulate such and such a thing?" And Bill says, "Heck, no! Make them prove it." <laughs> and that was, a, that, that was his, his, his philosophy. His son practices law here yeah, in Nashville. He's a fine lawyer. Fine lawyer and is uh, this year president of the Nashville Bar Association. Yes, that's yeah, right. That's right. In January 1999, the venerable law firm of Miller Martin in Chattanooga merged with the equally esteemed law firm of Tribune Sturdivant and DeWitt here in Nashville created a, a new entity uh, known here in Nashville as Miller Martin and Tribune. Tell us how you feel about that combination after so many years of, of the, the law firm that, that you had here. Well, <clears throat> I would say this. To, to, to begin with, that uh, the Tribune Sturdivant and DeWitt had changed considerably since I uh, retired from, from, from any active participation in the affairs of the, of the fund. Uh, I think that uh, Miller and Martin have refined and, and uh, the, the, the specialization, the intensity of the uh, practice uh, more than, than Tribune Sturdivant and, De and DeWitt did. 
Uh, my, the, the last things that I did were of state planning, and that got complex to the point where I would not think of writing a will without making one of the tax guys read it and tell me that it was all right, or, and they always managed to find something that I'd done wrong and <laughs> correct it. So <clears throat> I, uh, I'm, I am out of the practice, but I, uh, I think that, that this fund has got a, an, an enormous future. I think it's going to be a very, very powerful law fund. And uh, I think it was a good thing for my law fund uh, to, to have this merger. And I think that it will, that the, the lawyers that we have, that we had and have, that are now merged into the, the, new, the new one, Will, will be of very much benefit to Miller and Martin. And so I think it'll be, it'll be a, a, a strong arm. I think Miller and Martin needs uh, a, a, a strong office in Nashville, the capital city of Tennessee, because so much goes on here. One of the um, things that I learned about you when uh, these two firms merged is that you are uh, quite a legal historian, and that you have kept over the years journals about the, your practice and, uh, and have quite a bit of your father's correspondence and, and legal memorabilia. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you have? Well, <clears throat> back in the 1930s and 40s, the West Publishing Company would send lawyers, including me, a little small book with four or five uh, spaces for dates on each page. And I began uh, putting in there occasional legal things that I did, but all, I also put in uh, non-legal things, like if, if I went duck hunting, I, w I, 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 I would write that in. If, if I uh, visited, if, if, if I played golf, I, w I, w I would mention that, if I played tennis. Incidentally, the way I played golf was such a game that, it, I mean, uh, it, 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 it was not a game the way I played it, and so I went back to tennis. <laughs> but <clears throat> my father had uh, <clears throat> kept copies of his printed briefs over the years and had them bound up in separate volumes. And there would be a number of, of briefs in, in each volume. And there were 20 some odd volumes. And I think that something, I don't know what will ever, 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 ever become of those books. Uh, uh, for a while, uh, we, we, we put our briefs in there. But then the Supreme Court said it's OK to write typewritten briefs. And so uh, after that, but I know there are 23 or four or five volumes of those brown, of those printed, print, printed briefs, including a separate large volume, which has the entire record of the Vanderbilt case that my father had. That was the Vanderbilt trustee case, is that correct? Yeah, that was a suit where it was brought by, well, it's, I, 
I explained earlier that uh, Vanderbilt University was originally a Methodist school, a Methodist college. It was financed by Mr. Vanderbilt largely, his, his, his money, but the, the, it, 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 was, it was done by the church, and it was a Central University of the Methodist Episcopal Church South, that was the original name of the university. <clears throat> uh, when, when Chancellor Kirkland came along, Chancellor Garland was the first chancellor. When Chancellor Kirkland came along, he chafed under the rulership of the, of, of the church. And so in 1914, the uh, Board of Trustees hauled off and elected their own successors. I think all of the members of the board had their terms expired on, on, a, on, on the same date, and so they, they, they elected a slate. And the church said, you can't do that. We're the ones who, 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 who can nominate. Well, the question, the main question, was whether or not the board was self-perpetuating or, or whether the church had the right to, to elect its own trustees to the, to, to, to the board of trust. And, uh, the Supreme Court, I, I think the case was argued in the Chancery Court. My father, there were a lot of lawyers who joined in on, on both sides, and some of the trustees joined in as plaintiffs against the, uh, uh, against the university. Uh, but uh, father was the one who argued it in the Chancery Court and in the Supreme Court. And the argument in the Supreme Court took all day. And uh, the holding was that, uh, that the board was self-perpetuating and could, and could elect its own successors, but that the church, having founded it, had a sort of a right of overview. And that vexed Chancellor Kirkland. And Father told me that he told the Chancellor, he said, just don't worry. He said, this is the kind of thing that's going to, they, 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 they'll be, be so disgusted with, they'll, you, they, they, they'll re release. And within a few months, that's exactly what happened. So your father represented um, the uh, the board trust yeah. in that case That's against right. the Methodist yeah. Church. Um, he was a lawyer for the university for the during university. most of Chancellor Kirkland's administration. Um, Mr. Tribune, you've been very active over the years in organized bar association work, uh, including being president of both the Nashville Bar Association in 1958 and the Tennessee Bar Association from 61 to 62. Um, tell us about um, those experiences and how you think the bar, organized bar, has changed over the years? All right. Uh, my father, incidentally, had been president of both the Nashville and the Tennessee Bar Association, and uh, I was the first guy to hold both offices in the Tennessee Bar. I know Walter Armstrong, I think, is his father had been president. And I'm sure there have been others. You, you may know who they are. But uh, I, I was the first father, so I, I think. But <clears throat> back in the 1930s, uh, we were encouraged to go to the meetings of the the Nashville Bar Association and the Tennessee Bar Association. And 
uh, I, the law firm paid our dues and I think our expenses if, if, if we went to Memphis or to Chattanooga or to Knoxville. <clears throat> And I think that the, that, that the bar was was was, was more uh, well. There were, there were fewer lawyers, and therefore maybe more more interest in it. Uh, I still think that that, that 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 the bar association is a very very important uh, function. I like the Tennessee ball so much better than the American ball, which is, uh, has taken p some political views, which I don't think ought to be taken by a, uh, an association, which it, it w w will include people on both sides of a political question. But I, uh, I, 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 I think that the Tennessee Bar Association has been of of, of, of great benefit to the lawyers of Tennessee. In my, while I was uh, president, uh, I got Bill Leach Sr. to help me, and we got through the legislature. Uh, uh, Bill largely increasing the salaries of the members of our judges. Now, those increases look like very, 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 very small amounts, but, uh, I, I, but uh, I, I, we, we, we were of, of, of some benefit to the bar in that respect in those days. You mentioned that uh, in the earlier days, the law firms uh, actively encouraged the lawyers to be members of the Bar Association and paid dues and expenses. Um, some firms still do that and others do not. Um, do you think that that is something that law firms ought to do as a matter of professionalism? I know it was when I, when I was growing up. And, and, and actually, when I was active in the, in the association's affairs, uh, <clears throat> the size of the ball may be something that uh, makes it a little bit less personal. Although I still believe that, that, that these conventions, where you can meet with the lawyers from all over the state, and, and, the, and the seminars that are put on by the, by the association for the continuing legal education uh, are things that, 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 are, that ought to be helpful to, 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 to young lawyers. And I, and I, and I do think that, that they ought to at least go to a few meetings and and, and, and make a decision and not just decide, I, I would rather go fishing or I would rather play golf this weekend. We um, will wrap up our interview with you here in just a few minutes, but I don't want to leave it until um, I ask you to impart to the, especially the, the new lawyers who are watching this uh, interview, what advice you would have for new lawyers entering the profession. And what do you think your legacy in the law will be? Well, I would guess to work hard to keep your sense of integrity. And on the question of conflict of interest and that sort of thing, 
if you have to ask a question about it, don't do it. Uh, outside of that, I think it's in, it, 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 it is important for the members of different law firms as they mature to keep on friendly times with the, at least some of the members of other good law firms and try to keep a personal interest, a, a personal feeling, pr pr preserve that of the fraternity of lawyers, which I think is, uh, is of the is of enormous value. Uh, that's been what I have thought over the years. Uh, I have uh, done my best to, to help young lawyers. I actually could claim that I taught Bill Harbison how to try a jury case, and Bill got to where he was, if, if a lawyer in a small town got a big damage suit, he would ask Bill to come up and help him try it. He, he, he was so, 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 so effective before a jury. And Tommy Peebles used to say that every question Bill asked a witness came out of a book, came out of a, out of, out of a Tennessee decision where he was bringing the case within the, 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 the uh, holding of, of, of that particular case. Uh, now I think those are those are the best things that I can I can say about it. Mr. Tribune, we thank you very much for participating in the Tennessee Bar Foundation's Legal History Project. Uh, you are truly a gentleman, a scholar, and a wonderful lawyer, and I'm proud to be your law partner. Thank you. Now wait a minute. Uh, oh, let's let, let, let's break off a bit. I I, I could tell one or two stories of, of uh, humorous situations. Well, let's do that. We've got plenty of time. You can w we'll work them in wherever you want them. Right. You just, just keep going. That's fine. All right. <clears throat> you ready to go? Yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, I was thinking about Judge John W. Hildrop, who was a, a lawyer <clears throat> who came to Nashville from Virginia and uh, was a fine trial lawyer, but uh, he didn't keep files and uh, he had his own way of, 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 of doing things. One day I was at the courthouse and he was sitting as special judge for one of the trial judges and I was observing the trial and Judge Hildrip said, Charlie Tribune, come up here and sit on this bench with me and help me try this case. And so I got up there on the bench but I didn't open my mouth while I was there because, but, uh, <clears throat> and when we had, had another recess, I, I got down off the bench. But that was my first experience sitting on the bench. One time, two people, two, two, two lawyers were candidates uh, for appointment to fill a vacancy that had come about by reason of the death or retirement of a judge 
And each of these people asked Judge Hildrop to write a letter recommending him to the governor of the department. So he wrote <clears throat> identical letters of recommendation for both of these parties and made carbon copies of the letters, which he wasn't used to do, and he didn't believe in carbon copies, but he made carbon copies of these. And he sent the, the, the copies to the respective candidates and threw the original letters in the wastebasket. And so he, if, if, if the lawyer won, why he, he, he got credit. <laughs> he, he, if he won out of won, he got credit. Uh, one time, uh, Bob Sturdivant and I, we had uh, a birthday party every month at Tribune Sturdivant and DeWitt for everybody who had had a birthday during that month. Back in the kitchen and uh, we would all gather back there, the lawyers and secretaries. And Bob and I were talking to a couple of the girls and secretaries and uh, I remarked that I had never taken a driver's license test. And uh, they thought that was horrible. But you see, I got, I had been, I was uh, uh, in my late 20s. I'd been driving a long time uh, when the, the law came through. And so they just grandfathered everybody in at, at that stage of the game. And uh, so I said, I, 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 I explained that I'd been driving for a long time. And I asked Bob, I said, Bob, how old were you when you started driving? And Bob said, I don't remember. He says, I know I had a wreck when I was in the first grade. There was a, oh well, one, one of my good friends was, was a lawyer named Claude Callicott. And we were at the courthouse one day. You know, waiting for a court to open up so that we could start working. And I asked Claude, I said, is everything in good shape? And Claude said, I hope not. The lawyers can't make a living if everything's in good shape. <clears throat> uh, there was a story that my father told about a lawyer who always carried a briefcase with him, but never opened it. And he would bring it to the courthouse if he had a trial, and he carried it around with him, but he never opened his briefcase. And he said one year, the Tennessee Bar Association met in Chattanooga, and they got on a steamboat that went up the Tennessee River for a while for dinner. And this lawyer had left his briefcase in one of the state rooms on the steamboat. And so some of the young lawyers, including my father, decided that they would open it up and see what he had in there that was so important. And they found the necessities for practicing law. He found a deck of cards and a bottle of whiskey and a pistol. <laughs> that, was, that was all he, he thought a lawyer needed. Well, it's been a, it, 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 it has been a good life for me, and I'm glad that I practiced law, and I'm now glad to be uh, of counsel law, to have an office with Miller and Martin, and Miller and Martin and 
Tribune. Thank you, sir.